pray with me real quick before we open God's word together? Father, I just thank you for this time that we have. I thank you that we can gather together, we can open up your word together, give us minds to understand and hearts to obey. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to begin a little bit differently than I oftentimes do. I want to I begin by just reading from Psalm 119. Some of you are familiar with this psalm. Maybe some of you it's new. Um, but this is what the psalmist writes at the beginning. He said, Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that they are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees, then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. And Psalm goes on and on like this. In fact, this is the largest chapter in in the entire Bible, all 176 verses, they, they continue to highlight this connection between knowledge and understanding of God's way, his, his design for how we should live our lives, and then the application of that truth with the experience of, of blessing. Literally what the psalmist, tra- that word translates to, to happiness. And the, and the psalmist is just, is this expressive praise of, of God throughout this entire chapter for this, this blessing experienced in obedience and for, for in obedience. And for the psalmist, it's at least in part, it seems to be somewhat pragmatic. He, he, he seems to be just praising God, overflowing with worship for him, because he's like, it works. At the end of the day, I've understood your law, I've read it, and I've studied it, and I've applied it in my life, and I'm praising you, God, because what I've discovered is that it works, is that it works. Of course, we we could say that the opposite is is true as well, right? That, That when we choose not to follow God's law, that that when we choose to kind of do things our own way, that the results, I would say, if we're honest with ourselves, many of us would acknowledge that the results, that the place that that leads isn't that good. It it, it leads us in a place oftentimes where we feel like, you know what, things are not what I imagine them being. Perhaps you as a parent or in your workplace or or wherever you've experienced a a situation where you've told someone, this is, I want you to, to do this this way. If you follow these instructions, get this done, then then it's going to turn out the way I want it to turn out. And then they go and kind of do it their own way, right? And and maybe the job gets done, maybe it works out okay, but oftentimes it takes way longer than it's supposed to, and the end result isn't quite what you were hoping for. I remember as a a youth pastor, we take our students up to um, Baraboo, Wisconsin, for the annual winter retreat. Tom and Gretchen still take the kids up there, and on Saturday, they'll take them out to go skiing um, and, and at Devil's Head Ski Resort. And oftentimes, I would go over to the Bunny Hill at the beginning of the day to, to kind of work with some of the students who were just learning to ski. And you'd get them up, they'd may ride that little magic carpet ride up the hill a little bit, and then you'd get them up there and kind of sit that group down and give them a few instructions about what, what they need to know in order to make it down the hill safely. Um, you would talk to them about how to wedge their skis in order to control their speed a little bit and the importance of keeping their, their knees bent to kind of absorb the, the, the bumps and, along the hill. And then you would say, and if worse comes to worse, if you just feel like you're going too fast or you're out of control, just kind of lay yourself down, right? Just kind of fall over, stop there, we'll meet you there, we'll get you up, we'll get you, we'll talk about how it went and and keep going. But but like nine times out of 10, like it didn't go that way. Like there's something about getting up on your skis and seeing the hill in front of you that would cause them to to forget everything that we just went over. And I remember one student in particular, he was up at the top of the hill, he was excited for his, his first trip down but almost instantaneously, you could tell like this, this wasn't going to end well. 
And he starts going, and, and I'm kind of like, I could tell maybe halfway down the hill, like, he's going too fast. Like, he's, he's just kind of like, he's not wedging the skis. He, he's just a, a bullet, basically, heading down the hill. He's a projectile. And there's all these people, like, mingling at the bottom of the hill. So I'm saying, go down, you know, go fall over, lay down, lay down, and then just nothing, right? And so his, in, in forgetting all of these instructions, he just starts to scream at the people at the bottom of the hill, look out! You know, look out, I'm coming. And you see people starting to scatter. And then there's this, this snow fence at the bottom of the hill that's meant to kind of stop these sorts of moments from, from getting worse. But there's one spot in the snow fence that was open for a gate. And he was aimed perfectly at it. And, and so after everybody scatters, he just goes right through that gate. And after the gate, there's kind of a, a, a berm that separates the hill from from the parking lot. And so essentially now he's like on a ski jump, right? Like he hits and he just goes flying through the air out into the parking lot. He kind of disappears behind the berm. You see like skis and poles go flying everywhere. And then you just hear like this kind of like faint voice from the distance go, I'm okay. Like, <laughs> and, and you dust him off and you get him back on the side of the hill and you say, let's, let's start over, right? What, what is it that we need to know? Because you didn't do any of those things. Right? <laughs> we, we, we experience this in life. And as we're talking about these disciplines of grace, this focus that we've had all summer long, I encourage you to grab one of those journals that Gretchen talked about. It's a great way to track this in, in your life. This morning, we're going to talk about the discipline of obeying. The discipline of obeying, or, or put differently, simply doing what God says. And for many of us, this may sound basic or entry level, but I, I can tell you from 20 plus years of pastoral experience and even more so from my own faith walk, my journey with Jesus, that, that as basic or as obvious or as simple uh, as just obeying may sound to us, it is much easier said than done. That, that, that this is where so often for many of us where the rubber meets the road, this is, this is the point of the struggle in so many ways. And perhaps you've said something like this. I, I've said this before, but whether it's about a Bible study or, or a sermon or something like that, and you're talking about like, oh, I, ju I just want to go deeper, or I just love to get into kind of the real, like the real meaning of, of the text. I love to get into kind of the real meat of what the, the Bible's trying to teach us, or I love to study the Greek, and all of that is, is absolutely great. That is a great desire. We should do that. I love, I love doing that. I love to teach that. And yet, I will, if I am being honest with you, more often than not, at the point of struggle for me, is not, it's not a lack of understanding. It's, it's operating on what God has already taught me. It's, it's acting on what I've already come to understand. It, it isn't just about gaining more information about what it means to be loving or compassionate or generous or hospitable. It's choosing to respond in obedience to what I've already been taught. Maybe you can relate. James, the, the brother of Jesus, a leader in, in the early church, is... He's, he is very passionate about, about faith being more than mental assent for us. That, that it's, it has to manifest itself in, in obedience. It has to be lived out in, in action. And so it comes as no surprise that this is, is a topic or an issue that he addresses quite poignantly. So if you turn to James chapter 1. We're going to look at a few verses. This is about midway through the chapter. So James is kind of, he's, he's midway through a thought that he is teaching the church here. And this is where we pick it up now in verse 19. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. See, James in, in his, his passion for the church to, to understand what it looks like to follow Jesus, he, he outlines what obedience looks like. And there's a couple things that I want to highlight here from James's teaching. I want to begin where James begins with a clear warning. He begins at the point of a clear warning. He says in verse 22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. And then he immediately follows it up with this, this illustration. He's like, that, to do that would be the equivalent of, of looking in a mirror, seeing yourself, seeing your needs, seeing your condition, getting an accurate reflection, and then walking away and, and totally or completely forgetting what you just took in. When I was uh, um, leading one of our teams down to Puerto Rico uh, many years ago, we stayed in this small little, little church, not a ton of room. The kids had mattresses just kind of out on the floor, and, and there was just a little bit of bathroom space. And so they kind of designated the indoor bathrooms that were in the church. They said, okay, we'll, we'll set these aside. We'll let the girls use these. And then for the guys, they brought in um, some porter potties that they set outside the church. And those, those were our bathroom facilities for the week. And um, the, the one thing about a porter potty, um, or not the one thing, one of the things <laughs> about a porter potty is that they, they don't contain a mirror right? At least not the ones I've been in. And, and so really, I went through most of that week without really getting a good look at myself. And you're working out in the hot sun, you're, you're running a, a VBS program, I was, it was so hot, you're just constantly drenched and sweat. And so at the end of the week, I'm, I'm taking the students to the airport, I have a flight the next day, I'm going to go down to meet one of our other teams in Ecuador or Mexico and drop them off. And I, I check into the hotel that I'm, I'm staying at to wait for my flight. And I should have noticed that in the lobby, people sort of looked funny at me, but it didn't really, I didn't occur to me to think much of it. I just, you know, I check in and I go up to my room and for the first time in over a week, I, I got a good look at myself. And the news was not good, right? Like my, my hair was a mess. This is like back in the day before I had a beard. Like I had this scraggly, like half grown beard. I had uh, paint all over my shorts, which I should have been able to notice that without a mirror, and a rip in my t-shirt. And, and, and I looked like a mess. And that's one thing, right? That's, that's, if I get this information, now I have that information and I can act on it. But if I were to walk away from that mirror, and completely forget what I had just seen and go out and, and make a reservation at a restaurant or, or go someplace where the expectation is that you're going to come in a presentable manner, that would be completely inappropriate. And this is, this is what James is sort of setting up for us as it relates to moments when we take in God's word, we understand it, maybe we know it, but then we don't act on it. James, James shows us here, he gives us this teaching, this instruction about the early church, how he wants us to live. He says this, he gives us this moral imperative, he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and, and slow to become angry. He's like, I, I want you to get rid of all of this moral filth and this evil that's just so prevalent. I want you to humbly accept this, this word that's been planted in you. I want you to, I want you to Humbly accept the transformative truth of the gospel which saves us, he says. And then he says, be careful. Be careful that you don't hear this truth, that you don't even take it in and understand it and then walk away and do nothing with it. Because according to James, that would be the equivalent of, of looking into a mirror, understanding our condition, our need, and then and then turning around, walking away, and completely forgetting what we just saw. 
completely forgetting that, that encounter with truth. Essentially, according to James, he's saying, hearing God's word, remember that the, the early church oftentimes would gather in public places for the, the corporate reading of God's word. He's saying, hearing that, in that moment, he's saying, that isn't enough. It's not sufficient to hear the truth of, of God's word and yet not act on it or live it out. According to James, he's saying, you, you are essentially lying to yourself. And he says, church, don't, don't be deceived. Don't hear it and know it and understand it and then leave as if nothing in your life has changed. See, for years when, when I would read the book of James, James came across to me as, as harsh. So the, the, the church that James is writing to, is they're scattered because of a result of, of persecution. Like they're facing really difficult times. And sometimes... When I read James, I was like, man, that it just feels like it lacks grace or that James is just kind of an angry guy. But, but the more I have read this letter and the more I've understood what James seems to be trying to, to communicate to the church, he's, he's, not, he's not a curmudgeon. This is, this is the heart of a pastor who desires to see the people under his care living in the fullness of, of the life that Jesus has made possible for them. And he's, he, he doesn't want them to just know about it. He wants them to experience it. He, he wants the transformative truth of, of God's word to be their reality. And when he's saying it, he says it with, with passion, almost with, with desperation. James understands that there are these competing authorities in, in our world that the, that, that the church is experiencing. It's, on the one hand, it's what Paul refers to in Romans chapter 12 as the pattern of this world. The, the sort of the default operating system of the world that we're born into where, where we are our own greatest authority and it's about advancing ourselves as quickly and as highly as possible and, and everyone around you is sort of just a means to an end, Right? But James is saying that this, this pattern of this world, this way of, he's saying it's, it's a spiritual uh, Ponzi scheme, if you will. It makes all of these promises. You might even experience some, some early returns, but he's saying it ultimately leaves you in a place of destitution, emptiness, and, and, and alone. But then he says in contrast to this, it's, it's, this is what we have in God's word. We have, we've been taught the way of Jesus. We've been taught about his, his upside-down kingdom. And at times, it sounds counterintuitive to us, where the first will be last and the, and the last will be first, where the, the greatest among us is going to be a, a, sermon, uh, a servant of all. And, and sometimes it just simply sounds too good to be true, where grace and forgiveness are available, not because we've done something to earn it or we have accomplished that in some way, not that we've gathered ourselves together enough to be acceptable for God. He has accomplished it for us and he's given it to us as a gift and he talks about this way of Jesus and he says the promise of grace and it all leads us to life it, it leads us to what Jesus calls in John chapter 10 the the full life but he begins with a warning he's saying don't don't be deceived don't church don't fall for it don't, don't merely hear the truth of, of God's perfect way and then go out and live according to the pattern of this world because for James, for his passion for the church, he's saying it doesn't lead to life. It doesn't take you there. So he begins with this clear warning, but the clear warning is immediately followed up by a clear call, a clear and yet simple call in our lives. Look again at what James says in in verse 22 do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves do what it says he instructs us verse 25 but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it not forgetting what they've heard but doing it they will be blessed in what they do James is, is overt and clear. His instruction in light of that warning is to obey, is, is to do what it says. 
a couple years ago when I was with my um, family down in North Myrtle Beach. We've been going down there to vacation for years. I've talked about that before. And this was a, a while back. My, um, my daughters were younger. And so I was playing on the edge of the beach with my youngest daughter, Naomi, who was probably um, preschool at the time. And I was kind of maybe like thigh deep, or not thigh, calf deep in the water, and she's just kind of splashing around and playing. And then my two oldest daughters are out in the waves with their boogie boards, like with my mom, their grandma. They're playing and having fun and, and all of that. And as I'm standing there with Naomi and I'm playing with her, I see um, in between where my two oldest daughters are at and where I'm at, like a, a, a four-foot shark swim kind of right in between us. And, and mind you, this is also like when Shark Week is about to come on. And so I've like seen a thousand commercials of like a great white eating something. And, and so I, I immediately react, right? And I get Naomi and, and have her walk up on the, the, the sand and then walk out towards the girls. And I'm, but I'm also shouting instructions to them. Get in. I need you to get in. Get, get out of the water now. And they're out there with their grandma just having fun, just playing and my middle daughter sort of looks and like, Dad, we're fine. We're totally fine. We're safe. We're having fun. And that's when I got like that like dad face that you can get. You know, and I said, get out of the water now. And then like you could see kind of their continents turn like, oh, all right. Like he means business. And as they're walking out of the water, I grab them, I pull them in and, and in that moment, what I'm needing from them, what I'm wanting from them is to respond to what I'm asking from them because they know me, because they trust me. So they, they didn't have all the information I had. They, they didn't see everything that I saw in that moment. I was asking them to respond in obedience based on, on who I was, what I understood in the relationship that we had together, to respond in trust because they knew that, that I'm their dad, that, that I love them. See, this, the picture of obedience that James paints for us, there's a couple of things I want to I, I just point out real quickly here about the nature of obedience. One is that, that for James, obedience begins at a point of knowledge and understanding. James isn't, he's not dismissing the idea or diminishing in any way the importance of encountering God's word. In fact, he, he emphasizes, if you look up at verse 25, once again, three different times in this verse, he talks about the importance of understanding God's word. He says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, whoever reads it and continues in it, whoever is returning to it, not forgetting what they've heard, whoever is then remembering it, James is emphasizing the point of understanding and knowing God's word in our lives. Obedience for James begins with understanding. The psalmist in, in 119, he says it this way in verse 11, he says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, to be obedient is we, we are dependent upon a knowledge and understanding of how God taught us to live and how he's equipped us with that through his word. James is, is emphatic on this point. But he's saying this isn't, this isn't the end. The end is not knowledge. The end is not just merely understanding. The outworking of understanding is when we put it into action. This is what James is asking of us. The second thing about obedience is that it, it, it understands or it recognizes a greater authority. Obedience recognizes a, a greater authority. Obedience, by definition, is an act of submission to one who is greater than ourselves. And there is a, a, a lot that we could unpack here. In fact, I, I just even as I was preparing this week, and, and I was, I, I could recognize that point in my heart that was like recoiling to this. Because in my flesh, in my human nature, I still wrestle with that sense that I want to be in charge of me. That I am the captain of my own whatever, Right? We, we still wrestle with this, but obedience comes when we recognize and understand and acknowledge that there is an authority greater than ourselves. And of course, this has been modeled to us by Jesus. If you flip over to Philippians chapter 2, Paul's instructing us, and he, and he says, I want you to have the same 
mindset of Jesus. This is in uh, Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus, Jesus being fully God, fully divine, sharing in the work of, of creation, was willing to submit himself to the will of of the Father, and ultimately for our salvation. Now, if you are here this morning and you would identify yourself as a follower of Jesus. See, for me, it's, it's kind of this moment where I recognize, like, if, if, if he was willing to do that, I should be willing to do it. Like, that this is not too much to ask of me. Because the one who is my Messiah, my Savior, he was willing as being fully God to become obedient even to the point of death. Death on a cross, he writes. See, Jesus models for us what it looks like to be submissive even as the one who carried all the authority. Finally then, and and I think this is important, obedience is relational. Obedience is relational. See, the question that that I have to ask myself when I'm struggling with this whole idea is do I trust the one who is asking me to obey? Do I trust him? In James chapter 1, just a few verses earlier, once again he says, don't don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. See, if you, go, if you go back to that moment on the beach with my daughters out there and, and, and me sort of calling to them and asking them to respond to what, to what I was asking of them, what, was, what I was relying on in that moment was the relationship, was the fact that, that they trusted me and that they know that I love them and that I want good for them. See, this is what James, everything that James is teaching us, it's all rooted in the character of God. It's all rooted in the, in the belief and the awareness that he is good and that he loves you. Because obedience isn't always comfortable. And it certainly isn't always easy. And it's not what we prefer, but it's good because it leads us to life. It's good because he is good. Which is, is what James ultimately wraps up with here. And that is a clear result, a clear result. James 1.25, one more time, he says, but whoever looks into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So there's a, there's a result to obedience that James wants us to understand. Richard Foster, in his book, uh, The Celebration of Discipline, which is, is, is an excellent resource in everything that we've been talking about this summer. But he talks about one of the spiritual disciplines being a, a discipline of submission, or as we've been talking about it this morning, a discipline of, of obedience. And as he begins that chapter, he talks about how each discipline that he teaches on has a corresponding freedom that, that comes with it. And he writes this, he says, their value is a means of setting us before God so that he can give us the liberation that we seek. He says, the liberation is the end, the disciplines are merely the means. See, this is is what James is providing for us. It's the liberation that we seek and that we discover. It's, It's not in some misguided belief that we can act and live however we determine to be best. Right? That, Paul actually refers to that as, as spiritual slavery. But freedom, but this, this blessing that James and, and, and the psalmist in 119 describe for us, he says, this is the result of trusting the God who created you and who loved you, who designed you for relationship with him, trusting the fact that you can obey him. 
Trusting the fact that he, he knows what's best for you and that he's designed you to live according to that. The freedom that, is in, that we experience is when we live in alignment with our design. We, we live in alignment with our design and we live in alignment with the relationship to, to our creator, God. Because he loves us. Because we encounter that, we experience that, we live in that when we trust him enough to obey him. To simply do what he says. See, it's like actually in that moment when we stop carrying this incredibly heavy burden of our own will and that we, we experience the freedom of, of his will. I'll wrap up with this. I, um, over the years, I, I've had many students when I was a youth pastor graduate and move on into life. And, and you track with many of them over the course of time. And back when I was in Wheaton, um, um, Almost 15 years ago, I had a student that graduated, and she kind of moved on to life. I, I um, follow her on some social media, so I was somewhat familiar with what was going on. But a couple years ago, I, I began to see that something had changed for her. That she just um, had, God had brought her to the end of herself. She had this incredibly powerful encounter with, with Jesus, and she just couldn't stop talking about it. And so I was a little anxious to kind of hear the story. What, what, how did all of this unfold? And she actually began with a friend. She moved back to Chicago, and she's going to seminary, and she began with a friend, this, this podcast. And the, the purpose of the podcast is to look at cultural and societal norms and values and then just kind of lay that over a, a, the teaching of God's Word and to see how those interact. And, and as a part of the podcast, at one of the earliest ones, she began to teach, um, or she began to share her story, just kind of what had happened in her life. The, the, the one, her partner had kind of walked with Jesus for a long time and had this kind of long-standing faith, and she said, it's like, my experience was very different. And when Jesus brought her to the end of herself, she says, what I discovered is that the life that I had been living, which she probably would have uh, described as kind of like one foot in, one foot out, sort of Christianity. She's like, I was, I was living a lie. I was living as if there was no greater authority. I would accept an authority when it aligned with what I wanted, but when it didn't, I just kind of was able to dismiss it as antiquated or that's not applicable to our world or whatever it was. And she says, what I have discovered in this renewed relationship with Jesus is what she calls the joy of obedience. She's like, for the first time in my life, I am experiencing in the obedience of following Jesus in every area of my life an uninhibited and unrestricted joy and freedom. And so her passion now, because she looks at her generation, that kind of that, that late 20, early 30 generation, and she's like, so many of us have bought into a notion that, that we can live with kind of one foot in and one foot out, and life isn't going well for us, and we're not sure why. And she's like, I want them to know what I've discovered. I want them to experience the joy of a life that is sold out for Jesus and living according to, to his design for our lives. See, my prayer this morning for us is the same. That, that you and I would know what, what James points us to here. That the joy, the freedom, the, the blessing that they talk about is found in obedience to the loving God who created us and who made us for relationship with him. So this week, and each, each Sunday, each weekend, we've been talking about a challenge or a way to implement each of, of these practices. And I'm going to put up on the screen, I'm going to put up, these are where we've been so far this summer. All of the different practices and then the corresponding challenges that was associated with, with each one of these. And if you are anything like me, when you read these, you look at them, and there was some of them you're like, yeah, absolutely, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. And others of them that you were like, no thanks, right? Was I the only one? Okay. Here, here's the challenge this week. I want, I want you to go back to the one where you were like, no thanks, I'm good. I, I, want, you to, I want you to trust him enough to implement it in your life. 
Because I'm, I am willing to bet that on the other side of obedience, there is a freedom that he wants you to experience. So, so look at that list. Which one of them scares you? Which one of them would you rather avoid? Go back again this week. Say, I'm, you know what, I'm really going to work this into the course of my life. And see what you discover in obedience to him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time in your word. We thank you most of all that you love us, that you created us for relationship with you. So God, remind us again this morning that we can trust the one we're called to obey because you are good and because you love us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.